Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm your host, Isaac Nellist, and I'm joined again by Chloe this week, and we'll be taking you through the latest activist news from Australia and around the world. Green Left is a people-powered media project that centres the voice of activists and provides an alternative to the corporate news media. You can become a supporter today for only $5 a month at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Before we begin, we acknowledge that this podcast is recorded on stolen land that has never been ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Thousands of people marched the streets of Nam on July 7th for the annual NAIDOC March for Land Rights and Justice. The march was joined by young people and unionists like the Construction, Forestry, Mining and Energy Union and the Australian Services Union. The NAIDOC week theme was for our elders. Elders spoke about the stolen generations and the ongoing disaster of child removal policies. Gumba and Gear man Gary Foley told the rally, maintain your rage until we achieve freedom and justice. It's always good to stand up here and see big mobs of the local community being involved in things like this. Don't let anything hold you back. Maintain the struggle, maintain the rage, maintain the fight until we achieve freedom and justice. Protesters gathered outside Environment Minister Tanya Plibersek's office on Gadigal land in Sydney, calling on her to protect Spinibarra, also known as Lee Point, near Garamilla or Darwin, from being destroyed by a defence housing project. More than 50 people joined the SNAP rally organised by Uprising of the People on behalf of the Bacho family from the Dangalaba clan, Columbiringan tribe of the broader Larrakia nation in the Northern Territory. Spinibarra is a sacred site for the Dangalaba clan, and speakers said the protest would escalate if Plibersek refuses to halt the destruction. There has been this long-running campaign in Garamilla, Darwin, against the Biniburra housing development. Protesters blockaded the site and locked onto machinery when a dirt road was made at its entrance. Eleven protesters were arrested on July 6, including Larrakia woman Millie Ma May, who was demonstrating on her grandfather's country. And then a few days later, another protest was held outside Plibersek's office, this time against the new Middle Arm gas project in the Northern Territory. The protest was organised by the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, or AYCC, and supported by the Sydney Climate Coalition and other environment groups. And in 2022, the federal Labor government announced more than $1.9 billion in funding to Middle Arm, which is also on Larrakia country. And the project would expand gas exports and make way for the new gas basins like the Beetaloo and uh, Barossa uh, near the Tiwi Islands. And traditional owners and local communities are strongly opposed to these projects, with a speaker from the AYCC said Middle Arm would increase uh, greenhouse emissions in the Northern Territory by 75% and trample on First Nations rights. Civil and legal rights groups are urging New South Wales Labor to rethink its amendments to the Anti-Discrimination Act. They say religious exemptions in the current law are already discriminatory and that, they, and that the proposed changes are too broad. Josh Pallas, president of New South Wales Council for Civil Liberties, said there is uncertainty around the impact the bill could have on other fundamental rights. He urged the Anti-Discrimination Act be sent to the Law Reform Commission for examining, adding, it cannot be fixed with amendments. Pallas asked why the Catholic Church... Hillsong and the Church of Scientology should receive protection before trans people and sex workers. The Anti-Discrimination Act includes religious exemptions that would allow discrimination against LGBTIQ people, single mothers, women who have abortions and sex workers. This act means religious schools are allowed to fire LGBTIQ staff and expel LGBTIQ students. And the New South Wales Teachers Federation has decided to deepen its stand against the AUKUS Military Alliance and the $368 billion nuclear submarines, deciding at its annual conference on July 3 to expose and oppose the threat inherent in this rise in militarism and to work with anti-war, peace and broader union movements. 
Teachers Federation President Angelo Gavrilatos said in June that AUKUS compromises the pursuit of an independent foreign policy and has the potential to drag Australia once again into foreign conflict and war. He pointed out that for less than the price of one nuclear submarine, the government could fund the schooling resource standard shortfall for 26 years. And the New South Wales Department of Planning and Environment and the Land and Housing Corporation briefed community groups on July 6 on its plans to demolish and redevelop the Explorer Street public housing estate in South Everly. The estate, which was built in 1991, has 46 homes with mostly three and four bedrooms. The New South Wales Coalition's 2020 plan to privatise 70% of the site was met with protests. And attendees at the meeting were hopeful that Labor would abandon the Coalition's plans but we're disappointed to hear it's proceeding with them. Labor is going against its election promise to end the sale of public housing and to stop privatising public assets. This puts Explorer Street in the same basket as other public housing demolitions being planned at Wentworth Park Road, Glebe and South Waterloo. Another public housing estate that is already undergoing demolition is the Barack Beacon Estate at Port Melbourne. And activists, including the last remaining resident, Margaret Kelly, have been holding vigils at the site to protect it from demolition, as well as occupying the empty apartments for some days. The occupation was supported by the Victorian Greens, the Renters and Housing Union, Socialist Alliance, the Community Union Defence League and others. The police removed occupiers from the site, allegedly destroying banners with paint. Kelly and others are still fighting to protect the site. Yeah, and Green Left is actually holding some uh, upcoming public meetings around the fight to save public housing and the housing crisis discussion in general. Uh, There'll be one held in NAM, Melbourne, on July 27, which is, I think, a Thursday, and in Sydney on August 1st. So check out Green Left social media um, to find out more information about those meetings. The New South Wales Independent Commission Against Corruption, or ICAC, found on June 29 that former Coalition Premier Gladys Berejiklian and former Liberal MP Darrell Maguire had engaged in serious corrupt conduct. The investigation centred on Berejiklian's failure to disclose her personal relationships with Maguire when allocating funds to organisations which benefited him. She also failed to report her suspicion of Maguire's corrupt conduct. ICAC focused on two multi-million dollar grants issued to a gun club and a music conservatorium in Maguire's electorate of Wagga Wagga. Despite confirming the former Premier's corruption, ICAC is not going to pursue a prosecution, which is further undermining public trust in governments, which is at an all-time low. This is only the latest in a series of corruption scandals involving coalition and Labour politicians which have plagued New South Wales. Speaking of corruption and terrible governments, the Robo-Debt Royal Commission has cast immense shame on former coalition ministers. Reprehensible, cruel and illegal are some of the words used to describe the scheme, which led to numerous suicides and targeted already vulnerable people. Those implicated including former Prime Minister Scott Morrison and former Attorney General Christian Porter were quick to reject the findings of the commission. The sealed section of the report recommends that the individuals involved are referred for civil action or criminal prosecution. The report did not make a recommendation to offer systemic compensation to victims, but did suggest lifting job seeker and other payments, which should be a priority. Labor's paltry $20 a week raise was not enough, and the Anti-Poverty Centre pointed out that Labor is still pursuing more than 1 million people for so-called debts worth $5 $5 billion. I mean, this is just outrageous, <laughs> um, Isaac. I mean, people who were the victims of these horrendous robo-debts were threatened with, some were threatened with jail terms. So, I mean, even though we are prison abolitionists, politicians like Scott Morrison should sit in jail for devising the scheme. Yeah, someone's got to uh, take responsibility for the impact this had on not only on, on people's, you know, livelihoods and, and, and having to pay back all this money, but also on the mental health uh, impact that it had uh, on people. And yeah, as you said, led to um, numerous suicides. So it's a massive shame on all of those involved and we need to make sure uh, something's done about it. 
Ja. A protest on July 8 called on the federal Labor government to ban all military exports to Israel after Israel's brutal military assault on the Jenin refugee camp. Palestinian activist Amal Nasser told the rally that military weapons designed for war were being used against unarmed civilians, including children. Green Senator David Shoebridge called on Prime Minister Anthony Albanese to condemn the attack on Jenin, and we'll have more on the Jenin attacks later in this episode. Yeah, it's just incredible that there is still no worldwide com- condemnation of the injustice of the illegal op- occupation of Palestine. It's just, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, it, it's insane. Okay. On to other news. 50 people protested at short notice outside the Melbourne Immigration Transit Accommodation on July 3rd in support of Dixton Arul Ruban, a Tamil refugee threatened with deportation to Sri Lanka. Dixon's father was killed by the Sri Lankan military in 2009, along with tens of thousands of other Tamils. Dixon, then 13 years old, was put in an internment camp, along with his mother Rita and his grandmother. After their release, soldiers came to their house and sexually assaulted Rita. She fled to Australia in 2012 and was given permanent protection. Dixon managed to reach Australia in 2019 after his grandmother died, but was put in detention. He has now been told he will be deported. The rally demanded that he be immediately freed from MITRE and given a permanent visa. Protesters held signs calling for Rita and Dixon not to be separated. In a case brought by Iranian Kurdish refugee Mustafa Azimatabar, who's known as Moz, federal court judge Bernard Murphy ruled that while hotel detention is inhumane, it's still legal. Moz argued that his detention had been illegal. He'd been kept on Manus Island for more than six years, where he'd suffered from medical and psychological problems, including post-traumatic stress disorder, and he was brought to Australia under the short-lived Medivac law. But instead of being given treatment, he was detained for another 15 months in hotels that had been converted into alternative places to keep people in detention. While the judge uh, rejected that this was illegal, he did criticise the way Moz and others had been treated, saying that it showed a lack of care and humanity. Moz said the law needed to be changed and that he would continue his fight with the support of refugee rights activists. Against the backdrop of AUKUS, this year's biennial Talisman Saba War Games running from July 22nd to August 4th in the Northern Territory, Queensland, Western Australia and New South Wales will involve the most countries yet. It involved about 30,000 military personnel, primarily from the United States and Australia, but also from Fiji, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, Tonga, France, Britain, Canada, and Germany. The war exercises are designed to further integrate Australia into the US war machine and continue to drum up the war drive against China. A cancel Talisman Saba protest will be held on July 19 at Sydney Town Hall. In the last episode, we discussed the Japanese government's outrageous plan to dump radioactive waste from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean. And on July 1st, about 100 members of the Korean community and supporters protested outside the Japanese consulate in Sydney against the plan. Uh, The protest heard from environmental choir group Ecopella, as well as New South Wales Greens MLC Kate Fairman, New South Wales Labor MLC Cameron Murphy, uh, Reverend Moses Hans from the Castle Hill Presbyterian Church, uh, Nick Dean from the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network, Coral Winter from Socialist Alliance, and James Miranda from the Electoral Trades Union. Winter said that if Japan is to go ahead with the dumping of radioactive waste, Australia should play a lead role in taking a case to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea against Japan. Now let's hear what's happening around the world. (music) 
Israeli occupation forces launched a large-scale invasion of Janin refugee camp in the northern West Bank in the early hours of July 3rd. More than 1,000 soldiers stormed the camp as rockets and drone missiles struck homes and infrastructure. Al Jazeera reported that resistance fighters were trying to prevent Israeli soldiers from advancing further. The attack was driven by the Israeli government's need to satisfy the bloodlust of settlers and take revenge against the Palestinians resisting the theft of their land. Israel has allowed settler mobs to carry out pogroms against Palestinians, especially in the northern West Bank. Israel has also carried out its first airstrike in the West Bank in nearly two decades near Janine last month, killing three Palestinians, including a 15-year-old boy. While UN Human Rights Chief Volker Turk recently warned that the violence was spiralling out of control, people have pointed out that the violence is very much within Israel's control. The invasion is reminiscent of the 2002 assault of the Janine refugee camp, which inflicted wide-scale destruction and killed dozens of Palestinians. Yeah, it's terrible news and it's good. We've got to stand with uh, this struggle to free Palestine. Um, But over to France, there's been protests and riots breaking out after the police killed uh, the 17-year-old Nahel Merzouk for driving in a bus lane. Police had stopped Nahel on June 27 and they drew their guns, pointing them at him despite rules that only guns only be drawn if absolutely necessary. And Nahel was shot in the chest and died half an hour later. Um, 6,000 people joined a march in Nanterre on June 29 under the slogan Justice for Nahel uh, and riots broke out in more than a dozen towns across the country after the news broke with more than 650 people being arrested. Unsurprisingly, the mainstream media has focused its attention on the damage done by rioters and how to stop youth from protesting instead of focusing on how to stop police from carrying out racist executions or why police pull guns on teenagers. In response to the unrest, President Emmanuel Macron said the killing was unacceptable, but he has been overseeing a rising brutality in the police force for years, including a rule change in 2017 to encourage police to use their guns more which resulted in a doubling of the number of police shootings. In 2020 alone, 13 unarmed people were shot by police. Almost none of them were white. And meanwhile, right-wing politician Marine Le Pen and the police force are defending the shooter, claiming that he acted in self-defense. Some have attempted to curb the rioting, particularly parents who are worried about their children getting targeted by police. But without the riots, the officer who shot in a hell would not be facing prison and there'd be no chance at justice. But a broader movement is needed to ensure that the other officer is arrested and that police are disarmed and no more people are killed. The United States Supreme Court has been making some really bad rulings recently, with the reactionary right-wing majority doing all it can to undermine rights and wind back progress. On its final day in session on June 30, it ended affirmative action in college admissions, upheld voter restrictions in Mississippi, curtailed LGBTIQ rights and struck down debt relief for students burdened with higher education loans. The court sided with a web designer who refused to design wedding websites for same-sex couples, despite a Colorado state law that forbids discrimination against LGBTIQ people. This is the latest in a series of decisions that favour homophobes and religious groups over LGBTIQ people's rights. The Supreme Court also struck down a decision by President Joe Biden to provide debt relief to 40 million students with large debts from higher education loans. Student debts were frozen under the Trump administration in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The Biden administration said it would end the freeze but would forgive $10,000 in debt for people earning less than $125,000 per year. Yeah, some terrible decisions uh, uh, all recently. And the, one of those is the Supreme Court upholding a century-old Mississippi law that was used during the Jim Crow era to deny black people the right to vote and fully participate in society. And combined with the ban on affirmative action in college admissions, it represents an attack on black people's rights. These terrible rulings continue a pattern of right-wing rulings recently, 
with last year the Supreme Court voting to curtail the Environmental Protection Agency's power to address climate change and ruled that the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention was not authorised to impose a moratorium on evictions and also that the Occupational Health, Safety and Health Administration was not authorised to tell large employers to have their workers vaccinated against COVID-19. So there's these six unelected people who are able to impose their right-wing views on the entire country. That's, that sounds awful. Thousands of dock workers in Canada have been on a mass strike for more than 14 days since July 1st across more than 30 ports in British Columbia. The striking workers are members of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union and have shown the power of workers taking action. Workers are concerned about the erosion of work resulting from automation and outsourcing. Union members voted almost unanimously in favour of a strike action in June. Now, dock workers on the west coast of the United States are showing their solidarity by refusing to handle containers rerouted from the port of Vancouver. The employers walked away from negotiations and are relying on the support from the government to break up the strikes. Conservative politicians are urging the federal government to force dock workers back to work. It will take solidarity strong solidarity from other workers, unions and social movement activists to ensure that dock workers prevail. Yeah, we've actually had some news come in uh, while we're recording that uh, a deal has been reached between the dock workers and the bosses. Um, So uh, as you're listening, there will be more information online at greenleft.org.au. So check out the latest updates and we'll talk about it on the next episode of the podcast. Uh, Meanwhile, Kurds and their supporters in France, Germany and Switzerland have protested on July 8 over new death threats against Kurdistan Workers' Party leader Abdullah Erjalan, who's been imprisoned by the Turkish state for the past 24 years. The threats came in the form of anonymous letters delivered through tight security at the Imrali Island prison, where Erjalan is being held in isolation. Meanwhile, letters from Erjalan's lawyers and family are routinely blocked, and he's been deprived of all contact for the past 28 months since a short phone call with his brother in early 2021. The Kurdistan National Congress, which unites Kurds living in exile, has called on the Committee of Ministers and the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, the European Union and the United Nations to organise an urgent mission to visit Erjalan. A Perth-based mining company, Energy Transition Minerals, is legally challenging the Greenland government over its rejection of an application to mine uranium and rare earths in southern Greenland. The uranium mining ban was formally reinstated in December 2021 by the then newly elected coalition government. The mining company wants to claim 15 billion krona or 3.3 billion Australian dollars in compensation, despite Greenland's annual GDP only being 20 billion krona. These claims could topple Greenland's economy and basically seek to blackmail Greenland into allowing uranium mining. Danish Friends of the Earth campaigner Tall Green left the tribunal would likely reject the claim, but that the mining company could potentially hold on to its exploration license and hope for a change in the political climate in Greenland. You can read more about all of these stories that we've talked about today, as well as some incredible interviews with socialist activists from Russia and Aotearoa, plus videos, detailed analysis, and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. Rallies are being held around the country to mark 10 years since offshore processing of refugees began under the Kevin Rudd government. Refugees are calling for permanent protection and an end to temporary visas, and there are protests happening in Gamoy or Cairns on July 19 at the Western Lawn Esplanade, July 22 in Nam at the State Library, July 22 at the Perth Cultural Centre in Borloo, July 23 in Gaddy at Sydney Town Hall, July 23 in Mianjin or Brisbane at King George Square, and in Ingunawal or Canberra on July 23 at the intersection of Northbourne Avenue and London Circuit. You can find more details for all of these rallies at greenleft.org.au slash events. Greenleft needs your support to continue. You can become a supporter for only $5 a month and donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund to help us make more content like this. Go to greenleft.org 
greenleft.com.au slash support to help us out. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and threads for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening.